when you think about fintech, let's get into the whole fintech thing now. Um, how do you map out the various areas that you're looking at, and, and how would you kind of broadly describe the state of, of fintech? It's such, it's such, in some ways, an amorphous uh, term that kind of means everything from like Bitcoin to the UI on a consumer-facing application. Yeah, it's it's a term that's broad enough to drive a truck through, uh, and uh, it, it, it's amazing what currency it has gained just in the la in the last couple of years. Uh, but you know, really, uh, financial institutions have always been active in innovation, uh, in, in technology, uh, going all the way back to John Reed and City was a, was a great you know technology innovator. The the difference is that uh, we've had. Uh, the growth of Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, and, and other places across the country where you've been able to have focus teams uh, well capitalized by the venture capital community, able to do things in kind of experimental labs, if you will, sometimes uh, literally labs, other times figuratively. Uh, and that's enabled the pace of innovation uh, to accelerate. And the other thing that's happened is the great growth of consumer technology. And so once upon a time, technology was something that only existed in the institutions or, or enterprise, uh, but now the expectation of consumers, the amazing things that they can do on their phones, has driven a demand uh, for innovation in the user interface, and I'm using that term yep. very broadly uh, in, in terms of how we interact with our customers. So that combination of things, uh, you know, I, I think has led to uh, an explosion of ideas, people trying things. And let's face it, it's, it's easier to try things than to fail fast in a, uh, in a venture funded, uh, you know, garage sort of uh, operation than it is in a fully regulated, you know, bank with uh, the expectation by the FDIC and others that you're not going to fail fast. Uh, and so you can fail in pockets, but you can't fail as an institution. And that, that, but, that really but is... But how are they able to experiment? Is there a layer in which you don't have the regulatory concerns for a startup? Because it seems like the minute they start handling money and peer-to-peer -peer payments and trading, Aren't, aren't they immediately in the regulated space that you're in? Uh, not to the same extent, because the, 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 the clever thing that the fintechs have done is to uh, kind of ride the rails mm -hmm. uh, of some of the established players, uh, either literally through their APIs or, uh, you know, if, if you're Venmo, you're kind of an enclosed system, uh, and if you really want to get money out of the system, you have to connect back to the infrastructure, but if you've abstracted the representation of money, uh, it's easier to move around with, with much lighter, you know, uh, regulatory oversight. But when I think of like 10 years ago, they, they said that the, the VCs used to say like there's a couple areas that, that no one wants to go near. And, you know, music was one of them, right? Because we, we had seen the failure of Napster and that was a bad place to be and the record labels were going to kill you. And then financial services. That was another area where nobody wanted to go near. And then to the point that you're making, these rails opened up. Was it a mistake for the incumbents to open up those APIs? Was it a bit like um, the way the newspapers went online without, an, you know, with, without a clear revenue model, made everything free? Did it, was it a Pandora's box, you think, in terms of competition? No, I, I think we're going to find in the long run uh, that uh, everybody's better off with this you know, interchange uh, between the fintech community and the and the so-called incumbents. Certainly consumers will, will benefit, uh, but the major institutions will as well because they can use all the fintech uh, labs and all the, uh, the startups, uh, you know, effectively as, as experiments, right? And so, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, they like to talk about cooperation. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're competing, sometimes you're cooperating. And that's certainly the way we look at it at, at Ally. So we keep close tabs on, on all the fintechs some of them we watch in a competitive way, others we partner with, some we buy, others we, um, let's say, are inspired by their ideas right. and seek to instantiate uh, something on our own in a build way. Do you worry at all? I mean, you know, I don't want to name any of them by name, but sometimes when I experiment with one of these lightweight startups to do one of the saving things or the rounding up type things, you know, I'm always apprehensive to like put in my ACH, right? Um, and in fact, in some cases, I've set up a small bank because I don't want to connect it to my main bank. Mm -hmm. um, 
do you, do you worry? Is there, do, you, do you ever think to yourself, I'm going to wake up one morning and it won't be you, but some startup is going to have a breach and 100,000 checking accounts are going to be accessed? Uh, I worry about that all the time, uh, and, it's, and it's not just startups that have to worry about breaches, yeah. as we've seen, uh, you know, certainly uh, even among the big guys. Uh, but I think you're hitting on something that I think uh, gives the incumbents an advantage over some of the startups, uh, and that is the trust factor. Uh, and so, yes, you'll trust uh, a clever, uh, a company with a clever UI uh, up to a certain point, uh, but you do want to know at the end of the day that there is an institution that, that's, that's more than the building uh, that's protecting your money. That's why I, I kind of like our positioning, uh, because having been born in the digital space, we get to adopt some of the sleek UI characteristics and, and customer experience characteristics of, uh, of the fintech companies, uh, but we are a, a financial holding company with a bank holding company, with a bank, so there's multi-level of uh, regulation and structure. And so there's no question uh, that we're gonna be around, that your money's gonna be around, uh, but if we can do some things that give you the experience mm -hmm. uh, of some of the uh, startups, then I think that's kind of the best of both worlds. That's how we've been positioning ourselves. I, and on the point you made about inspiration, uh, and I'm gonna qualify this question, how do you think about build versus buy versus copy? And I think that copy is a misunderstood idea in the technology industry. I thought that when Instagram copied Snapchat stories, Kevin Systrom, to his credit, came out and said it was a good idea, it made sense in our app, yes, we copied it, yes, we put it in. And there's no patent on having a bunch of pictures in sequence. When you think through those three categories, what's the economic assessment, and how do you sort of perception-wise think about copying? Yeah, so, so uh, we boil that analysis down uh, into some pretty rudimentary factors. It's like time and money, basically. So um, when we look at uh, a space we want to enter, a client segment we want to serve, a technology that we like, it's always a case of how do we get there at the lowest cost in the, in the shortest amount of time. Sometimes speed of market outweighs pure cost, other times pure cost uh, is, is the deciding factor. So when we look at build, buy, partner, et cetera, uh, you know, we look at those factors, and uh, I can give you, a, you know, an example. We were looking at the robo-advisory space uh, starting about a year ago, and we were really looking at all of those dimensions. We were, we had a bunch of uh, startups in talking to us. We were thinking about, uh, you know, acquiring them, uh, uh, potentially partnering with them, uh, but we were also at the whiteboard designing our own product. Uh, it just so happened that as we were kind of through the design, a property came on the market, a company called Trade King that we acquired in, uh, in, the, in the summer, which was uh, a, a discount broker, online discount brokerage as well as a robo-advisory capability. And we said, we can now jump into the market, inherit this capability mm -hmm. immediately with a profitable business. There are not that many robo-advisors that can say that. Uh, and then build on it from there uh, by integrating into the rest of our products and services, which we're, which we're in the process of doing now, and in a matter of a couple of weeks, we'll be, we'll be rolling out a very nice integrated product uh, that I don't think we could have done in that time frame had we started with the first line of code. Let's, let's move to uh, millennial consumers. Uh, my team, Melissa and Nicole, are here. Uh, we met with a large bank today, and we, have, we meet with many large banks that say to us, our consumer, um, is a 50, uh, is 50 or 60 years old. And millennials don't have any money and then we're not interested in them. And as shocking as that is to say, I, I cannot tell you how many times I hear that in a week. It's so binary. We, we meet with financial services players that say we want to get to these customers and we meet with those who say they're not our customer. Um, how do you think about that? And, and how do you think about those who think about it differently from you? You know, look, if you have a relatively entrenched business model with a P&L that has to be supported, expectations of shareholders, of management, of the board, et cetera, it's kind of difficult to jump into a millennial market. Uh, you know, over there, there's an exhibit that talks about Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Right. Uh, so the well-heeled consumers are the ones that have the money. Um, in, in, in our case, 
again, we, we don't think of it as having quite that stark a distinction between uh, uh, more established customers and millennial customers. In fact, I've been trying to banish the word millennial inside of Ally. I've not succeeded, by the way. Uh, but but um, having created three millennials myself, uh, one, one of whom's 23 tonight, so I'm already in trouble for not sure. being at her birthday party, but I'll get there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've been trying to banish the word millennial in favor of 21st century consumer, right? Because it's really about how you, let, you want to consume financial services, and that drives the, uh, the, the, the tech savviness, that drives the customer experience, mm -hmm. and so on. In our case, uh, when we started the bank, um, we really weren't interested in millennials per se, because millennials deposit very little money and do a lot of transactions, just like my kids do. Uh, and what we preferred to have were people who deposited a lot of money and did very few transactions. We called them purposeful savers, and a lot of our marketing in the early days were, uh, was uh, directed at, at, at that client segment. What we found, however, was when you produce a slick UI, an easy way to do business, phenomenal customer service, this 21st century uh, consumer is attracted to that, and we wound up with a, a, a significant uh, millennial uh, customer base uh, who are not only interesting in terms of numbers, but interesting in terms of how active they are in social media, which then helps us build our brand, which then has kind of a positive effect on the rest. So now, as we're looking at things like expanding into robo-advisory, discount brokerage, uh, and, and other online financial services, and we're looking at the huge intergenerational wealth transfer that is you know, happening in the current years, the, the, the ability to lock in the millennials uh, with uh, a, a, very great, you know, a, a very interesting client experience. So as they grow in their careers and as they grow in this wealth transfer, uh, we think we're very well positioned then uh, to serve that market. But part of it is because we didn't have to drag around a legacy business model. We're not dragging around branches. We're not dragging around brokers who you know, sit across the table, financial planners. Uh, who, by you know, m most judgments, the next generation is not all that interested uh, in dealing with. Where they'd rather have uh, facts and tools at their disposal on their phone, uh, the ability to use chat interface mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And so, um, I, I think for some uh, legacy uh, competitors, they're going to find it harder to do that because it's just too hard to give up the legacy population, the legacy P and L and what that means in terms of their expectations. The last question before we bring up the panelists to join us, and I think it's a, a fitting question as you, as you make this big rollout with Trade King, what is your big picture of how the 21st century consumer will trade and how will they go back and forth between their banking and their trading relationship? Uh, well, wait and see, because we're about to roll that out. But uh, yeah. you know, clearly, um, the 21st century consumer wants to see uh, a much more, wants to have a much more seamless experience. Uh, they don't think of their money uh, as in entirely different uh, pockets. Uh, they think of their money as more seamless, and in some cases they want their money to work hard in a certain way for a certain goal. Uh, in other cases, they want their money to be a pot uh, for transactional kinds of things, but they don't want to think about going to two different institutions to do that. So for us, we're thinking hard about uh, life cycle approaches, uh, but we also know that the, the, the mechanics of moving money around and the mechanics of providing client service have to be seamless for that generation. They don't want to call the mortgage department mm -hmm. over here and the bank department over there and the broker there, much less go in to meet with people. They want to be able to see how all of those pockets of money uh, you know, can be managed uh, and managed with devices and at a time and place of their choosing. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Stay My right pleasure. there. And now we will bring up Maria, Tarek, and David uh, to join the, pa what, we go off now? I think I go off and you stay. You don't. You don't stay. <laughs> I'll be here. You okay. Can toss right, a question and, and then we do questions at the end. If there's a question for Michael, he'll join in on that. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.